All right, if you have a Bible, let's, uh, let's go to Ephesians 4. Uh, where we are in this passage is kind of, it's kind of interesting just to dive in. It's easy to look into your scripture. If you are like me, I like to see the headings in scripture and see uh, in my Bible, it says the new life. In the ESV, it says the new life there. In different translations, it'll say something that seems like it's speaking to an individual. And that's not really the context of what Paul is talking about here. Where we were as we looked into Ephesians 4, we saw in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, this is the gospel being laid out. This is the good news. And then when we turn the page here into Ephesians 4, now he's talking about the church as a whole. And as we look at the church as a whole, as Ephesians 4, 1, it says, Walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you have been called. Paul says the same type of thing in 1 Thessalonians 2, 12. He says, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own glory uh, and kingdom and glory. Or Philippians 1, 26 and 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Translation, behave as citizens of heaven, even though you're still here on the earth. This is the idea of what Paul's going after in pretty much uh, all of his letters to the church. There's this gospel that has come, and you as a church need to respond as recipients of this gospel in a way that follows suit to what has already been given uh, to you. And I know this is really hard as children to understand what it means uh, to live in this way. And yet, I'm going to call each of you to just kind of lean in uh, to what Paul is saying here in this text. Now, how many of you grew up in the uh, giraffe age of the toy store? Now, do you know what I mean by the giraffe age toy store? Remember that? Anyone know what I'm talking about? No, this toy store, Jonathan, man, you are my friend. You come to church, you're my friend. Every week you have a big garden and and this week you're like that age. Now, here's the thing. I, I don't know that you grew up in this age. Okay, now here's the thing. Anyone remember the, the theme song of the, 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 the giraffe toy store? Remember that? I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. There's a that I can play with. Yeah, you, you remember that because that jingle was like it was everywhere. And I remember like pretty much every single one of my shows when I was a kid had that commercial in there. Now at that day and age, like you couldn't go online and and just order. And then a couple days later, it showed up. We had to get in the car, which in my day and age was like the station wagon. Now, some of you are like, I don't know what a station wagon is, you know, but you get in the station wagon and then you would go to that store. And when you got to that store, it was like, we had just arrived in like heaven on earth because they had like every single toy that you could ever imagine. And I would think that it was a parent's worst nightmare to walk into that store because I got to have pretty much everything that's in every single aisle of this store because there really were like a million things to play with in this store. Any, anyone feel me? Any, anyone know what you're talking about? You remember that? Now here's the thing about the commercial. None of those giraffe-like Toys R Us commercials were like kids playing together that I can remember. There was always the kid that was doing his own or her own thing in his own corner or her own corner, corner doing their own thing. Play. I mean, some of you can email me with some little snippet of the theme song that had the exception of that role, but I don't remember such a thing. They were playing by themselves, doing their own thing. I think that, that, that not wanting to grow up really with those type of toys were like really highlighting selfishness and like my own thing. What Paul is going after here is the exact opposite. That really maturity isn't about being selfish and being isolated. Really it's about, no, no, no. We learn to mature. We learn to share. We learn to be a part of this kingdom that God has given us in such a way that it is about us. It's not about me. 
It's about him and his kingdom come. It's not about my selfishness and my desire. Listen, we live in a day and age right now where selfishness is all around our culture and it has invaded the church. Churches are splitting like wildfire over the craziest of things. And Paul is saying, may the church never be this way. And that's what Paul is going after here in this text. My role in a healthy church is the title of the sermon today, My Role in a Healthy Church. And we're gonna go through these verses uh, together. Uh, let me scooch my notes over here. I wish I had more hands than what I have. I'm gonna put my Bible down, and I wish I had a little bit more hands here, but here we go. Follow along verse by verse, and I'm gonna sum some things up as we go. He's not talking about me individually. He is talking about us together. Okay, and don't give in to the idea of the new life as being my new life. It's about our new life together. Verse 17, check this out as we go. Now this I say and testify in the Lord. This is Paul talking. This I say and testify in the Lord that you, that you is plural. It's not uh, you singular, you plural, must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, as those who do not have any hope in the futility of their minds. Now, if you're not used to what that word futility means, the word futility means short-term thinking, short-term thinking. If you have your own Bible, you want to write this down. If you have a bulletin, you want to write this down. Futility is all over the New Testament, short-term thinking. Don't walk like the people out there who live in short-term thinking, okay? Don't, don't think like that. And, and, and if you have your own Bible, you definitely want to circle or highlight the word mind because mind is all over this text. Actually, I want to back up for a second and get this main idea out. This should be up on the screen. God saves people from isolation and destruction into his family, which is the church. Gives them gifts to serve and commands them, that's right, commands them to grow up into representatives of Jesus. This is the idea of what he's going after in chapters four, five, and six. God saves people from isolation and destruction, that's immaturity, from being under the curse, into his family, which is the church. Gives them gifts to serve and commands them to grow up, to mature into representatives of Jesus. That's the idea. And he says, if we're going to grow up, we cannot be living like those who have no hope in the futility of their minds. He lists off uh, half a dozen different things, different characteristics of people who are living as those who have no hope. The futility of their minds, the short-term thinking. Look at verse 18. They are darkened in their understanding. Have any of you ever been in a cave have there, any of you ever gone like down into a cave? Several years ago, some of us went on a mission trip down to the Dominican Republic, and, and it's weird because uh, they're like, hey, we're gonna go on this one day like excursion. And we went down into like this staircase that looked like there was no bottom. And we went, kept on going and kept on going, and then all of a sudden the lights were off. And I thought I'd been in darkness before. I had never been in that much darkness before. It was dark as in dark. They're like, put your hand out in front of you. And I could not see my hand. I was like, this is weird. This was very, very dark. The darkness of their understanding, they can't see in front of them. They're alienated from the life of God. In other words, they're isolated from any sort of purpose. No understanding of what we're even here for. They, they, they can't see it because of the ignorance that is in them. They're unaware due to the hardness of heart. They have become, and really, you wanna underline those two words, have become callous. It's a progression, becoming callous. And have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. What Paul is describing here is this downward spiral. It's a progressive spiral that's happening, and he's looking back to right at the beginning there, in, uh, right before verse 18. He talks about the futility of their minds. 
This is the progression of sin that Paul and other uh, early writers talk about. It's, it's, it's the idea of where we kind of flirt with a little bit of sin, a little bit of exploration, a little bit of like, I'm going to take a step this way, and then I'm going to take a little step further, and I'm going to take a little bit step further, and then all of a sudden I become desensitized to my own sin. Now, don't overlook this principle because the principle not only happens in the scripture, it happens in real life too. We start with this idea and it's just a little look. It's a little gaze. It's a little bit of like, this might be harmful. Oh, that didn't hurt that bad. I'm trying to keep this rated G. And then all of a sudden, it becomes increasingly, huh, that didn't hurt that bad. And all of a sudden we get sucked into something and all of a sudden it's taken over our lives. This happens all the time online to people. It happens all the time in office settings. It happens all the time. And people excuse it away. They rationalize it away and they say, I don't think this is going to be that big of a deal. And all of a sudden people's marriages are over. People's jobs are over. All of a sudden people's lives are over. They lose sight of their reality because it was just this fleeting thing that didn't look like it was going to be that bad. And all of a sudden what seemed to be innocent all of a sudden took over their very life. What Paul is talking about here is the reality of the downward spiral of sin. And he's saying that they have become callous because they have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And he's saying to the church in Ephesus, that is not the way that you learned Christ. And it's interesting here because if you read what he's saying here in verse 20, is that the way that we learn Christ is that we hear about Christ and we're also taught Christ. We are exposed to the teaching of Christ, and also we sit under the teaching of Christ. We hear about him in passing, and we're also taught him in almost like a teaching-type, discipleship-type setting. That's important that we hear that. As children, those of you who are parents, our children need to be exposed in passing to Christ and the teaching of of our faith, but they also need to be grounded in uh, like a teacher-student type disciplines of the faith, some in passing and some more uh, rigid in learning as the truth is in Christ. Now, let me sum up on the screen what Paul's talking about in these few verses. A maturing person no longer thinks and lives like those without hope. That's what verse 17 is talking about. A maturing person no longer thinks and lives like those without hope. Now, if you are around people and you've been working with someone or a neighbor that you've been interacting with, and let's say that you're with them for months or even years, and then one day you find out because they say, hey, I'm a Christian, and you're surprised by that, there's a problem. Likewise, if you've been with them for months or years, and they find out that you're a Christian, and they're surprised, there's a problem. There should be a distinctiveness by our faith and how we're interacting with one another. Paul is saying there's a difference between their, those who have no hope and those who have hope. Do you see what he's saying? And that's what he's elaborating on here. Those who are maturing, Paul's saying God wants us to grow up. This is what a church ought to be doing. We should be growing up. A maturing person no longer thinks and lives like those without hope. Verse 18 and 19 summed up, a maturing person no longer is desensitized to their own sin. Now that should be a no-brainer. But yet at the same time, how often do we get sucked into our own sin and then we hide and think, well, if someone found out that I'm a sinner, then all of a sudden people would turn their back on me. How would people in church think of me if they knew that I was a sinner? What if they knew about that specific sin that I've been struggling with? What would that mean for my job? What would that mean for the, for the way that I've been serving in the church? What type of credibility would I have? Goodness gracious, people, this is the essence of the gospel. People need to know that we are sinners. We are in the flesh. We have not come to -to face-to-face with Jesus and receive glorified bodies. Therefore, you and I will still sin. Therefore, we hold on to the truth that God has saved us and he is making us new into the image of Christ. We need to be a confessing people. Let's say that together. 
We need to be a confessing people. Let's say that with conviction. We need to be a confessing people. That's getting a little bit better, come on. We need to be a confessing people. If we're not a confessing people, we are a people who have embraced hypocrisy. We need to be a confessing people. That, that makes us actually uh, look not like the world if we're confessing people. And, and guess what? We're an obedient people if we are a confessing people. Paul's going after, we've embraced the gospel if we are a confessing people. If we hide our sin, then all of a sudden we've embraced hypocrisy. Third thing here of these first few verses, a maturing person no longer is ignorant to the truths of Jesus. A maturing person no longer is ignorant to the truths of Jesus. Look at verse 20 and 21. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Now, some of you, I already know some of your hands are gonna go up on this. How many of you love law? Okay, some of you love law. Come on, all of you proud lawyers in the room. Come on, raise them and praise them, come on. Come on, come on, come on. There's three of you that I know for sure. Come on, raise them, come on, raise them. Okay, the proud little powwow after the service, you love law. How many of you love Romans? Come on, Gary, raise your hand with this too, okay. Yeah, if you love Romans, all right. Now, there are three distinctive parts of Romans uh, chapter one that you should absolutely uh, have, have in here for sure. Romans 1.20. Everyone is without excuse because God has made himself known. They are without excuse, verse 20. 24, 24 says that God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts to impurity. Why? Because they embraced the sin over the creator God. Even though they knew God, they gave up um, the, the, the existence of God because they, they wanted the impurity over God. 26, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. 28, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what, they, what ought not to be done. In other words, God, I know that you exist, but I would rather live out the desires of my flesh. God, I know that you exist, but I really want this instead. God, I know that you exist, and I know that your ways are right, but I'd rather be living out the futility of my line, this life, this short term, oh, that looks so much better than, oh, I want this. Even though the truths of Jesus are right there, I want this instead. This is what the insanity of our fleshly desires are in front of us. And Paul lays this out right in Romans. And this is what Paul is saying in Ephesians. It doesn't make any sense in that what the world around us has given themselves up to. Now, I don't want us to read this with judgment. I want us to read this, read this with compassion. Not with judgment, but with compassion. As we transition, I want you to see why. Because all around us, all around us, there's a cultural lure that says, if the populace says that it's right, it must be right. This is all over the place. In pop culture, in the news, all of media, all of writing, if culture says it's right, then it must be right. Therefore, we will ignore the truths about God because the temporal thinking, the futility of our minds, okay, says that it must be right. We must understand that something is happening within the minds of culture. And I wanna display this through this picture up on the screen in this story. How many of you boys and girls can tell me what this is up on the screen? What is this? Does anybody know? Luke, say it really loud. It's a battleship. Now, can tell me, can anyone tell me, because it's black and white, can anyone tell me kind of, do you think it's a new battleship or an old battleship? Okay. What do you think, Kate? Old one, that's right. Can, now this is a big guess. Do you think that this ship is still floating or do you think that this ship is out of commission? Go ahead, Olivia. It's out of commission for sure, okay? Now how many would just raise your hand if you think it's at the bottom of the ocean? Come on, really high. Yeah, if your hand's really high, you're right. Jonathan, thanks for helping me again. On July 30th, 1945, the USS Indianapolis was headed home across the Pacific, having delivered a cargo of enriched uranium. 
that would be instrumental in the ending of World War II. A Japanese torpedo ended the return journey. In the first 12 minutes after the attack, the ship sank and 300 men died. More than 900 men, some grievously wounded, ended up in the salt water without fresh water to drink or shelter from the sun and with no protection from sharks. Of the 900 that entered the water, only 316 survived for four days and five nights in the ocean. Check this out. The chief medical officer, Captain Lewis Haynes, was one of the survivors and reported what had happened. When the hot sun came out and we were in crystal clear water, you were so thirsty, you couldn't believe it wasn't good enough to drink. I had a hard time convincing men, the men, that they shouldn't drink. The real young ones, you take away their hope, you take away their water and their food, they would drink the salt water and would go fast. I can remember uh, striking men who were drinking salt water to try to stop them. They would get dehydrated, then become very, very sick. There were also, um, there were also mass hallucinations. It was amazing how everyone would see the same thing. One man would see something and then everyone would see the same thing. Even I fought hallucinations off and on, but something always brought me back. On the 19th of August, 2017, a search team financed by Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen located the wreckage of the sunken cruiser in the Philippian Sea, or the Phil Philippine Sea, sorry, lying at the depths approximately 18,000 feet below. This horrible account reflects the intentions of Paul's warnings in this passage. We, of course, are struck and perhaps taken aback by the urgency of this, his warning. But there is a great grace in the sternness. He tells us that the sin that looks so enticing as almost innocent to our spiritual health is like the water of the ocean. It looks so clear. It looks so enticing. It, too, looks clear and innocent. But once consumed, it not only fails to satisfy, but makes us desire it more and more. And what, it, what is actually poison to us and deadens our senses to what is good. And when our minds are clouded and darkened to its effects, we begin to see the hallucination like the rest of the world, like those who have no hope, convinced us that there is hope where there really is no hope at all. Mass hallucinations may even occur in a Christian community when brothers and sisters taste the water that seems almost innocent and declare it to be good. The reason that sin does not satisfy is the same reason that salt water does not satisfy either. We were made for what the Bible calls living water, the truth and life that is only found in Christ Jesus, who said, if anyone thirsts, let him come and to me and drink. Whoever believes in me as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, whom those who believe in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. See, all, all around us, there's this longing for living water. It looks so good, and yet there's mass hallucinations. Oh, but this is good, this is good, this is good, this will give you life, and yet it only delivers false hope. The sin that so easily entangles us and leads to death is all around us. We're being led astray like sheep to the slaughter. And Paul is saying that you who have hope, you are the church, it's time to grow up. We've been saved by grace. We've been given gifts by grace. And he's saying it's time that you, the church, we, the church, that it's time for us to mature. How do we do that? Look at verse 22. Stay with me here. Verse 22. Put off the old self, which belongs to the former manner of life. It is corrupt through deceitful desires. These misleading temptations promises one thing, but delivers something totally different. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, there it is again, your minds. And put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. See, a maturing person sees sin and its wrath 
as unsatisfying. Have you ever gotten to the place? Maybe it's taken years. You've been just going after the same sin. I just need another hit. I need another fix. I need to go after it. I just need it right now. And you get to the place where you're like, I'm so tired of fighting this sin. I'm so tired of going after the same thing. It doesn't satisfy. It doesn't lead to any hope. It doesn't fulfill. I thought it would, and it doesn't. I feel trapped. I feel isolated. I, I feel alone. I just want rid of it. See, that's part of the old self. You have been set free in Christ. If you've received Christ, you are free. Those chains of sin no longer hold you captive. You are free. Jesus said so. A maturing person, verse 22 and 23, knows the mind's battleground. It's in the mind. It's in the mind. This is real simple. What are you consuming? What are you consuming? What are you watching? What are you listening to? Where are you finding pleasure? Where are you escaping to? Where are you trying to find hope? What are you trying to like get you through the day? What is numbing the realities of all of the pressures in your life? What is that? Where are you going to whenever life just feels overwhelming? Where that is, is your refuge. Perhaps it's an hallucination. Perhaps you're poisoning yourself. Perhaps it's a place where deceitful desires of temptation is leading you to a place that's promising one thing but is fulfilling nothing. And it's just isolating you further and further away. And you need to have one of those Popeye moments. If I had all I could stand, it stands it no more. Maybe you need one of those. Now, that's going way back before my lifetime, but I do like those old shows. Anybody with me on that? Okay, there's like three people that know what I'm even talking about. So when I was growing up, we had like three channels, and you had to actually get off the chair and spin the dial and then move the rabbit ears. Now there's two people that even know what rabbit ears are. Okay, so maturing person, this is big, pursues the mind and activities of God. Verse 24, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness, true righteousness and holiness. Some people say, well, well, I I get this idea of like putting off the old and putting on the new. Is that like clothing? Is it like a cloak? Is it like I need to go shopping? No, you don't need to go shopping. Okay, You you don't need to buy anything. What you need to understand is what, what has already been, what is already, what, what, what wardrobe you need has already been purchased. And it's already been complete. The gospel isn't what you need to do. It's been already been done. Jesus already did it. What you need to do is take to heart what, what Paul wrote in Philippians 4, 8. It's up on the screen. I, I like this thematic version from the New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, one thing, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Okay, listen. I want you to look up on the screen and let's participate in this together. This, This is the litmus test. If you don't remember anything else of tonight, and I know it's hot in here, I know it's sweaty in here, I know some of you have kids around, I get it. But look up on the screen. Let's just say this together. You can read. Okay, let's just say this together. Dear brothers and sisters, out loud with me, come on. Dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts, see that's the mind. That's the mind, okay? Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. See, see that, that's the test. That, that's the test. If you're going to go online, there's nothing wrong with going online. There, there's nothing wrong with turning on the radio. Okay, there's nothing wrong with reading a book, fact or fiction. But that, that's kind of the test. 
If you feel like your blood pressure is going up, if you feel like your thought life is going crazy, if you feel like your anxiety is going out of control, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to judge you on things, but, but, but the Bible has given us something right here. One verse. One verse right there. If you feel like all of those things are happening, this is the verse you go to. This is a test. Well, what is pure? What is honorable? That word means a value. What is a value to your soul? This world says it's got all sorts of things that it promises to you. The check in the mail is not going to fix your problems. The paycheck's not going to fix your problems. The promotion's not going to fix your problems. The investment's not going to fix all your problems. The relationship's not going to fix your problems. God's given us this. Before you sit down and you start to complain about, listen, I'm not even talking about this church, any church. Man, that church just isn't healthy. Man, man, that, ch that church has so many problems. Before we start to like knock against the bride of Christ, when you start looking in the mirror and understand like, Am I contributing to the church's health? This is the conclusion. My role in a healthy church is to do my part in thinking and living in a manner worthy of the gospel. I'm not alone. I'm united with Christ and his people. And we pursue his kingdom. We pursue his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom. And all of these things will be given to you. Hey, before I go, and the worship team comes back up and, and leads us and concludes the service uh, together, um, I want you to see in the, in the bulletin, we were going to do an outdoor service next week, and I had one oversight with that. And that is there's some people that aren't back with us yet uh, from the live stream. And I want to be sensitive to people who, who aren't quite ready to come back. Maybe they're waiting for their... Their, their second vaccine shot, or they're just not ready yet. I want to be sensitive to them. And so, um, so we're, we're not going to do that quite yet. We will do that this summer, but not quite yet. Um, I want you to also pay attention. Uh, in, the, in the bulletin, there's like this volunteer sign-up sheet. Um, whether we like it or not, a, as we come out of this pandemic, it's going to feel like we're replanting the church. That's what it's going to feel like. Whether we like it or we don't like it. <laughs> Heather's asked me several times, you, you ready to, to like plant another church? Like not leave and plant another church, but are you ready to like do this? I don't know if I got another church plant in me. Like I feel like an old man, to be honest with you. But here's what I'm excited about. I'm excited that I can sit back in this room and, and that there's a team up here that can do this and I don't have to be up here. I'm excited that there's people in here that, that can come in and preach and I don't have to be up here and preach all the time. I'm excited that we have elders that are learning what it means to be elders and, and, and before we know it, like Dave's gonna be up here preaching and I don't have to be up here and preaching all the time. And that, that makes Dave super nervous. And, and I say to Jeff, he's like Moses, you know, like who wants Aaron to speak for him, but Moses and Aaron did a lot for the kingdom. And, and so I'm ready for that. Like, I don't need to be up here all the time. And I'm grateful for that. I told you that I took a job with uh, Acts 29 part-time back March 1st because we're going to accelerate the process to get to phase two. And I want you to pray for that. And part of the reason for, for that happening is because we need more people empowered to serve in ways in the church. I don't want to be up here all the time. I'm more of an introvert, and I would rather other people be up here more than me. Okay? I'm not going anywhere. I want more people empowered up here serving in ways um, that multiply kingdom efforts. But would you sign up? We want to plug more people in to serve and, um, and pray to that end because uh, Jesus said that the kingdom is his and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's going to use ordinary people like you, ordinary people like me, and um, I'm excited for what the future holds. But be praying for us. We have uh, some exciting things happening behind the scenes in the church, and uh, we're waiting for God to give us the green light for things to happen behind the scenes, and uh, be praying for that end as we pray for you, we pray praying for us also. Uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night that we can gather together. May we grow up as your church. May, may we mature 
as individuals, uh, may we put excuses beside, uh, aside. God, I pray that you would see us as being faithful. We're not perfect. We're not professionals. But I do ask, Lord, that, that we would not be contrarians. May we throw sin aside and wait that hold us back from running a race that you called us to. I ask, Lord, that as we worship tonight and as we serve you throughout this week, may we have eyes to see how you're moving, how you're working. And ask, Lord, that, that you would use us in ways that would surprise us. As children grow up in our homes and in this church, May you call some to the mission field. May you call some to the marketplace to work in offices where they'd be a light to the people around them, to vocations where there's darkness, where darkness abounds. May you empower them with your spirit to do things that are far beyond our wildest imaginations. And ask, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see things, even now, that would really shock us when we see you face to face, knowing that even now, that you are working in ways that we just don't even fully understand. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.